Hey guys, and welcome to another Walk-In Wednesday. I have a really cool gun to show you. A very rare gun, old workhorse as you can see. This is a 1911 Colt, you recognize it right away. Uh, except, it, it was, it's very rare because it was issued to the Russian government in 1916. Uh, this gun really reminds me of a video that we just did recently about a Springfield 1911 that was purported to be a battlefield pickup. Um, I think a lot of you didn't buy the story, but it's an old workhorse as well. Now that gun, as ugly as it was, uh, I know people get offended when I say guns are ugly, beat up, as beat up and old, kind of like me, beat up and old as it was, that had over 200,000 views within the first two weeks. So I'm hoping we can break that record with this 1911 Russian Colt. Now this gun does not belong to me or to Legacy Collectibles, but instead uh, a local collector brought it in. He was watching our videos, thanks for watching. Uh, Ed, we'll call him Ed because that's his name. Uh, Ed brought this in and said, hey, I think this would make a really cool video, and I agreed. The way he got this is a, a story to tell. In fact, if this gun could talk, it would have quite a story to tell. And so I'm gonna kind of walk through the story of this gun as, as much as we know about it, and uh, I, I think you'll be surprised by some of the history behind this gun. So the first thing this gun would tell us was it was uh, born in 1916, and then it was issued to the Russian government in August of 1916. You can actually see the letter, the factory letter, and in researching uh, information about this gun, I found one in much better condition. And by the way, they're almost always really beat up like this because they literally were through several wars. Um, they're usually beat up. They're not usually found in this condition. In my background here, I, I found on the internet, uh, we'll do a close up of that. Uh, we found one that's only about 800 guns away and it was a group of 5,000. You can see 5,000 were issued to the Russian government. And these were both shipped on the same day. Uh, what makes these distinct is not only the serial range, because there were uh, actually between 1916 and 1918, there was about uh, 66,000 of these sent out. That, that number surprised me, because these are so rare, they just never show up in the United States. Uh, they have a hard time coming back to the United States because basically they were issued to uh, Russia, which didn't uh, trade guns with us uh, as a general rule. Uh, now they do a bit, but as a general rule, Russia did not trade guns with us. Or they were sent to Russian allies and they do not trade guns with us. So they rarely show up here in the United States. And so to find two of them that were shipped on the same day is uh, quite a coincidence. So. First, let's take a closer look at this gun. Uh, now you can see it's almost all white metal because the finish is completely gone. At one point it was blued, and uh, these of course were blued guns. Um, 1916, World War I was going on. We'll talk a little bit about that in, in a bit, but it has, the, um, it has the standard logo for a 1911 Colt on the left-hand side. And you can see the uh, Colt Stallion on the tang of the slide. Again, pretty worn. These grips look like they're original to the gun because of the wear pattern. Again, it's just uh, really uh, heavily worn. Um, the magazine also looks, it could be original to the gun because of the wear uh, on the magazine. The bore is a bit of a surprise in that it has strong rifling, but it is frosted throughout. So uh, meaning there is some corrosion, especially in the grooves. Um, but overall, the bore, I would rate it a 7 out of 10. It's, it's not bad at all. But again, the condition of the gun is not pitted. It was cared for in terms of uh, wiped down and, and kept uh, uh, free of rust and pitting. So uh, for that reason, it's uh, in, in pretty good condition uh, for an old Russian war horse. Um, now, the, the, it is a commercial gun. If you look at the serial number, it's covered up. But all of these uh, indicates that it had a C prefix and then the serial number. So all 60, uh, 60 some thousand of these were commercial guns um, that were contracted to the Russian government for World War I. So I took the time to take this gun apart. Nothing remarkable, the uh, feed ramp uh, is, is polished, so kind of in the white but corroded. There is an S mark on the frame. Uh, I'm sure that's a proof mark. There are other uh, proof marks. You can see the inside of the slide. 
On the frame, when you look under the takedown lever, you can see that the, blue, the original bluing is still there. So unexposed areas uh, that weren't heavily wiped are uh, still in the original blue. The barrel is in a remarkable condition uh, in that, again, the bore was not too bad, but also there's a lot of bluing left on the barrel. And on the barrel, uh, you don't see any markings on commercial guns, uh, by and large, other than a letter stamp, which would be an inspection. And here you can see the P, which is pretty common inspection stamp for the barrel, but otherwise unmarked. Could be the original barrel, I can't say for sure. So let's talk a little bit about the history of this gun, which I find even more interesting than the gu gun itself, um, because the history is so rich. So Russia entered the war in July of 1914. That's when World War I broke out. And Russia, it was because Russia was uh, allied with the Serbians, and Germany was allied with the Austria-Hungary Empire. Um, so those two f spheres of influence have actually been fighting a Cold War for about 10 years, uh, competing with each other. And France had gotten themselves into it by backing Russia. Basically, they told Russia, if, if you happen to go to war with Germany for any reason, we got your back. And of course, Britain was allied with France. So once the Archbishop of the Austrian-Hungary Empire was assassinated by a Serbia, uh, Russia was uh, pretty much duty-bound to go to war with Germany and the Austria-Hungary Empire. And then, of course, France was duty-bound uh, to go to war and support Russia. And then Germany was, of course, duty-bound to enter the war on the side of France because of alliances with France. So all of that uh, began a very complicated World War I. But in general terms, it was royal family obligations. Uh, they were interrelated, a lot of cousins and distant relatives throughout Europe, part of the royal family. The Romanov family was related to royalty in France and England. And so these royal families were going to war, but the people who fought and died were the common folk people. And that was no more evident than in Russia, because in Russia you had the royal family, the upper class, and then you had a very poor peasant society. So the upper class goes to war, the peasants uh, do the fighting, uh, they're sent to the front lines, and um, if you read the history of it, Russia really wasn't prepared. Even though they threatened war for uh, several years, when the war actually broke out, they didn't have enough equipment, so they sent men to the Russian front without the proper equipment, without the proper clothes, and therefore the peasants died by the tens of thousands and then hundreds of thousands and eventually by the millions. Uh, they were led by aristocratic, usually, um, rel again, distant relatives of the emperor, uh, those were the officers. They were fairly inept. I'm sure that's an opinion um, that uh, people have written over the years. Uh, but generally, it was found to have poor leadership, poor organization, and poor supply lines. And that's part of the history of this gun. This is why this, this is important to note. Uh, they, were running, they didn't have weapons. They couldn't produce enough weapons. They did have the, uh, as far as a pistol, they had a Russian Nagant. But they didn't have enough of them, and they couldn't produce them fast enough. And so there are other examples, uh, and one of them that comes to mind is the uh, Luger. There is a Russian Luger, much more rare than the uh, Russian 1911 Colt. But uh, you can see here a picture of a Luger that uh, has the crest, which is the crossed, it's actually a Mosin Nagant. Uh, you can see the crossed rifle was their crest on the Russian Luger. They are very rare. I, I have owned one in the past. Um, uh, they are heavily faked or else refinished, as are these 1911 Colts. They're not so much faked as they are refinished and reworked because they really have been through a lot. But uh, that crossed X, just as an aside for you P38 lovers, um, I, I've heard it told that the Russian X uh, from Russian captured P38s in World War II is actually a crude imitation of the crossed, crossed uh, rifles. Um, not sure that that's true, but it's an interesting piece of information. If you see a Russian X uh, on a P-38, uh, they also captured some uh, Lugers and did the same thing. Uh, you will see this X on the, on the gun. So they searched Europe um, and the United States for available weapons, and of course the United States was able to step up, but they did the deal through England. Um, and that's important because uh, one of the things that you may not have noticed was the Cyrillic writing, which is basically 
English made or English con contract. You can see it a lot better in this other gun that I found on the internet. Again, uh, only about 800 uh, serial numbers away. You can see the Russian inscription. Again, English order or English contract uh, is the general interpretation. They went through England. The order went through England. It was financed by JP Morgan and it was a Lend-Lease program. I don't know if these were ever paid for, but they certainly were paid for by Russian Lives. Uh, so 66,000 were ordered. Uh, the order came through England. Some of them are marked with the Cyrillic, Cyrillic writing and some are not. I'm not sure why some are and some aren't, but I did find within the same shipment, some were not marked. So I had different theories about the ones that came straight from the United States were not marked and the ones that came through England were marked, but I can't prove that. If any of you know, help me out, uh, let me know, but it does seem that more are not marked. So to find one with the Cyrillic or, or Russian writing on it is, is a lot harder, a lot rarer, and these do command a premium. So once the, these guns arrived in Russia, they actually sat on the docks uh, unissued. Again, uh, poor logistics, um, they, they weren't able to get them to the, the fighters and the docks were, were pretty much uh, run by the lower class. Uh, the dock workers uh, were all from the peasant class and therefore probably like our unions today, uh, the longshoremen, they control the docks. So what happened to these guns is they didn't go to the troops that the Russian government intended, but they, they arrived sometime in late 1916 1917, the Russian Revolution started. So these were actually uh, seized at the docks and distributed to the revolutionaries, the Russian Revolution. One of the ironies of this gun, and this gun in particular, is uh, the Romanov family. You can see a, a picture of them here. Most of you know uh, they were all executed in the middle of 1918. So again, this gun arrives in late 16. The revolution starts in early 17, and um, it is recorded that uh, the Tsar was shot by a 45 caliber. I presume it was this gun. I think it was this gun. I, it just speaks to me. Now, I know some of you love to beat me up about my lack of provenance. In this case, I'm just sure it's his gun. It, this is the gun, because I can feel it. Okay, so don't bust on me. Of course, we don't know uh, which gun was used, but a gun like this was used to kill the Tsar. Uh, but they also had other weapons, other calibers. It was pretty much a bloody massacre. Uh, there was a, a broom handle involved from, uh, from the history that I read and also Nagant. Um, so different guns were used, but a 45 caliber was evidently used. Um, also, 45 caliber is an interesting part of the story. The Russians didn't make 45 caliber ammunition. So after these guns were issued, uh, they can only be used for a short period of time, but evidently they ran out of ammo, ammo very quickly. Um, and so we'll come back that, to that in a little bit. So the guns were delivered to the Russian government all the way up until the middle of 1918, and basically were not going to the troops. The troops uh, mutinied. They just walked off the field. Some of them killed their own officers um, and walked off the field, refused to fight, went back and joined the revolution. So things came unglued very quickly. Uh, the revolution lasted through most of 17 and culminated uh, in, a, in the fall of uh, 1917. And so by 1918, these are still coming in, they are distributed, but again, lack of ammunition. Uh, the United States after the revolution and the allies were no, no longer supplying uh, the Russians. So a lot of these just went into storage or went into people's possession and uh, between the wars, they were probably uh, put in storage. So then everything changed when World War II started because, uh, as you know, uh, surprisingly, they, uh, Germany was allied with Russia and they you know, basically broke, broke the treaty and invaded uh, Russia in June of 1941. So suddenly now, and this is a much different war, because before you have the royalty uh, using the peasants to fight their wars, now uh, um, Germany has is, is attacked Mother Russia, and so the people rise up and uh, stage a heroic defense of uh, Leningrad and the rest of Russia, and finally uh, make a huge comeback and uh, basically win the war with our help. 
But uh, these guns were then pulled out and used in World War II. There is record of these guns being captured by Germans. So German soldiers, when they came in, they did capture some of these guns. But there also was a second Lend-Lease program. So 1911 A1 Colts also went to Russia as well as England. Um, so there was a Lend-Lease program. And again, if you know, it, was it ever paid? I don't know. It was paid certainly in Russian lives because Russia lost more men in World War II than any other army. So they made huge sacrifices and uh, we were proud to be able to help supply them with arms and ammunition. So during World War II, the ammunition did flow again. These were used in World War II. So again, take another couple layers of uh, finish, uh, put a little more wear on this because now we've been through a second war. So what I found interesting is after the war, I mentioned that um, they, had, they captured a lot of P-38s, actually hundreds of thousands of P-38s that they put in storage and kept. And probably because they were 9 millimeter. I don't know for sure why they kept them, but they kept them in storage. The, the holsters, uh, the reason I know that is they all came out not too long ago after the fall of the Iron Curtain. Uh, Russia, East Germany began exporting these to the West because they have them in, in storage. Uh, usually they were Russian dipped which is like a tarry substance that dries on it that kind of keeps it, uh, keeps it uh, from corroding. Um, but, and also the Russian X, as I mentioned earlier. The nine millimeters they kept until the fall of the Iron Curtain. Uh, but these, they shipped to other countries. That's the, the point I wanted to make is these nine, uh, 1911 Colts ended up going all over Soviet uh, satellite states. Uh, so, for example, many went to China when they became communist, and some of them were involved in the, uh, uh, the Chinese Revolution. Uh, some of these came out of Vietnam, so I assume they went to China. China sent them to Vietnam. Uh, they end up in Vietnam, captured by uh, U.S. servicemen. And this gun in particular, remember the gun that shot the Tsar? It ended up in Iraq. This, uh, the owner of this gun uh, said that he got it from an Iraqi vet who brought it back from Iraq as a captured gun. So you can see why it is so hard to, to bring into this country because it's not import stamped. There's not a, a normal channel to bring these in. They have to come in through other channels. We'll remain vague about that. But basically they come into the, this country from uh, places like, like Afghanistan, Vietnam, and, and Iraq. So all that is to say, if this gun could talk, it would have quite a story to tell. And I'm really proud to bring it to you today. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. An old war horse that went through a lot and now docu documented for all of history on our YouTube channel. And that's why it's important for you to like and subscribe. Uh, tell your friends about our channel uh, because I have a lot more just like this coming at you.